Luke 23, we're going to read verses 1 through 25, but we have a memory verse that we need to learn. Let's uh, look at this and let's say it together and then we'll take it away and say it without it on the screen as best we can. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18, and take it away. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Cross doesn't make sense if you don't know who Jesus is or, or believe in him. It just doesn't compute. Uh, but for us who know him and love him, it is everything that we hope for and long for. So Luke 23, starting at verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. Before this day, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept on shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found nothing in him, no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. And that's where we'll stop for today. Now, if you're like me, you, you read this story and you think, how in the world could they have done that to Jesus? How could they have asked for somebody like Barabbas, who is a murderer, instead of Jesus, who had done nothing wrong at all. You know, how could they have done that? It's easy to wonder that, but let's take a look at this from the people's perspective here a minute. The Roman Empire was the epitome of pagan wickedness. The Roman Empire was thoroughly pagan and thoroughly wicked. Worshiping false gods was integral to every aspect of Roman life, whether that's family or business or government or holidays or events. Everything was related to worshiping some sort of false god of some kind. The emperor was worshiped as a god, even. 
There's, a, there's an inscription to Caesar Augustus, who was emperor when Jesus was born. And it says that providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in the most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors, and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good tidings of the world that came by reason of him. They're, they worshipped their emperors as, as God, as savior. Even their coins, they did not have coins that said in God we trust on them. They basically... They had the picture of the emperor there, and it says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. That was the coin when Jesus was doing his ministry. The Roman way of life was full of violence and depravity. Every aspect of Roman life was full of violence and depravity. Now, the Romans were very efficient rulers. They were expert engineers, and they were masters of warfare. They were very effective but they were very morally depraved. They would go to war against any tribe or nation that would stand in the way of their greatness. Julius Caesar, he just went on this rampage for loot and for slaves so that he could get more approval in Rome itself. So all kinds of people were massacred and enslaved just so Julius Caesar would get higher approval ratings. Romans enjoyed watching slaves kill each other in the arena. In the gladiatorial games, about three and a half million people died in gladiatorial games. They called them games, but they were really just fights to the death. Romans considered compassion a weakness, and so these games were, were useful to teach how to face death with courage. It reinforced the importance of being Roman by showing how hated slaves, criminals, and foreigners should be just eliminated in the most brutal ways. Until the Nazis built their concentration camps, I learned this this week, before the Nazis, the Colosseum was the smallest site of the most killings in history. Tons of people died there. Sexual promiscuity, prostitution was legal, common, and encouraged. Marital faithfulness was virtually non-existent at all. Nobody was faithful to their spouses. Oil lamps, bowls, cups, and vases all had pornographic imagery on them. And they had no birth control. So what do you do with all of these excess children that you have? Well, infanticide is what you did. That was the common Roman thing. Or you abandon your newborns in trash heaps or in the city square. And sometimes people who enslaved people would find these babies and raise them up to be slaves. Slavery was around a quarter to a third of the whole population. And slaves had no rights, and no punishment of slaves was too severe. All kinds of torture was used on your slaves if they did not do what you wanted them to do. Roman soldiers and rulers would terrorize the people. The army, I read this this week, the army lived off the occupied country, pilfering its natural resources, enslaving members of its population, raping women, and generally terrorizing, terrorizing the populace. You did not want to have Roman soldiers occupying your country. Roman taxes were a heavy burden. The royal family of Herods, which there were many of them, they imposed heavy taxes to support their military ventures and their major building projects and their lavish lifestyles. And one estimate that I found, we don't know for sure how much people paid in taxes, but one estimate that I found said that your average Jewish family paid 49% of annual income on taxes. 49%. That's about half of your income going to taxes. And if you're living a hand-to-mouth existence, you are barely scraping by and they tax you this much?
Most Jewish people knew of somebody who was sold into slavery or executed because they couldn't pay their taxes. So, this is the situation that Jesus did his, where Jesus did his ministry. This is what was going on. And Jesus, as it says, even in our passage today, is the king of the Jews. Pilate asked him outright, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you said so. Which is not, a, it's just not an enthusiastic yes, but it's a, it is a yes. Jesus is the king of the Jews. In verse 2, it says that he is Christ. And because Pilate is Roman, they, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have understood what that meant. So they say he is Christ, a king. When you claim to be Christ, you're basically claiming to be a king. So Pilate got the idea. Oh, here's somebody who's claiming to be a king over and above Roman rule. And Jesus was a revolutionary leader. Jesus was overturning all kinds of societal norms and thoughts and ways of doing things. For example, he touched people with leprosy. People who had leprosy were supposed to stay on the outskirts of the city and they were not supposed to come close to anybody else because if anybody touched somebody who was a leper, then they themselves would be ceremonial unclean, would not be able to participate in any temple functions or anything like that. And so if you had leprosy, you had to stay way far away. And Jesus went up to people who had leprosy and he touched them. And instead of him being contaminated by that, they were healed. He turned that around. Jesus declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. And he allowed his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. This was against all of the Jewish traditions. Not against the law, but against their traditions. And he healed people on the Sabbath who didn't have life-threatening conditions. So he's turning things over all over the place here. Those are just two examples. Jesus came declaring that the kingdom of God had arrived. The, the very first uh, message that we have from Jesus in, in Mark, it's on the screen there. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel or good news of God. Oh, whatever. There we go. Proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. The kingdom of God is here. Luke 17, 20 and 21, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, the kingdom of God is me coming into this world now. Jesus came declaring the kingdom of God. He was the king, and he was saying the kingdom of God has arrived. Okay? Now certainly, if God's kingdom was coming into this world... That would certainly mean overthrowing this evil pagan empire of Rome, right? But no. Just a couple chapters before this one, Jesus told people to pay Roman taxes. What was he, what was he thinking? I mean, the elders in our passage charge Jesus in verse 2 that... They, he forbid us to give tribute to Caesar, which was a flat-out lie. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, pay your tax. Now, this doesn't make any sense. Jesus showed so much care for people who were poor and people who were oppressed. He showed care for these people. He touched people who were leprous and he associated with these people. And he does nothing to help their tax burden. He does nothing at all. In fact, he has a tax collector as one of his 12 disciples. And he uses tax collectors in his parables as positive examples. This guy's on the side of Rome, basically. Jesus never spoke against any of Rome's injustices. He never said anything about that. I mean, of all of the awful things that happened by the Roman Empire, Jesus never spoke against any of those. And of all the people Jesus speaks against the most, 
It's the most upstanding people, the Pharisees, the people who are following Moses' law as best as they possibly can. And he goes after them. And all these terrible activities of Rome, Jesus never says anything bad about them. On the contrary, Jesus healed a centurion servant and remarked about how this centurion had great faith. He never said anything like that about any of his own people. If anything, Jesus taught cooperation with Rome. He told, told us to cooperate with Rome, this, this evil empire. He said, do not resist an evil person. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Not even a Roman soldier forcing you into his service. A Roman soldier could legally just stop you from doing your work and say, you are going to help me carry this loot for a mile. They were allowed to do that. They could interrupt your day and say, you are going to help me carry this for a mile. Let's go right now. And Jesus said, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. It's like Jesus is on their side. Well, you want us to help them twice as much as what we're supposed to? The king of the Jews was not going to overthrow Rome and, if anything, taught us to cooperate with them. They celebrated his entrance into Jerusalem with palm branches just five days before until they realized that he wasn't going to stop this evil empire. Jesus not only won't stand up to Rome, but in verse 9, he doesn't even defend himself on trial. Not before Herod, and, and not even really before Pilate. He says, you have said so. That's the only thing he says in this whole passage. You have said so. He affirms that he's the king of the Jews, and then he's going to do nothing to even defend himself on trial. He's not standing up to Rome. As far as the Jewish people were concerned, this king of the Jews was doing nothing to help them. Nothing at all. By contrast, there was Barabbas. In him, they saw a courageous hero. Here's Barabbas, who's standing up to this evil Roman Empire. It says that he was involved in an insurrection. The word literally means to stand up. He was standing up to this evil pagan empire. He was doing something about it. He wasn't just letting it go or turning the other, turning the other way and turning a blind eye to it like this Jesus was. He was going to do something about it. He was like Robin Hood. He was willing to stand up to this false god worship. He was willing to stand up to depraved rulers oppressing his people. He was the one saying, give me liberty or give me death. Barabbas is the guy. And tragically, they chose Barabbas over Jesus. They chose Barabbas. It's fascinating how verse 25 is worded. If you still have your Bibles open, look at that again. It says, he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. He released the guy who was in for insurrection and murder and he gave them Jesus to do with whatever they wanted. Ironically, Jesus is going to die for what Barabbas actually did. It's not unlike you and me. That's how Jesus takes away our sins. Jesus dies, not for what he did, but for what you and I have done. He takes our sins upon himself. And I think that there's a lot of these Jewish people who rejected Jesus and chose Barabbas. I think there's a lot there in us too that's worth paying attention to. When we carry heavy burdens, we become short-sighted. This is just human nature. When we have burdens that are heavy, 
burdens of any kind, we become really short-sighted. The people here, they were experiencing heavy burdens of, of taxation and oppression, and they were short-sighted because of that. When you're struggling to feed your family and when you're seeing evil people do evil things for evil ends, you, you want justice now. You want to be able to feed your family now. You want something to happen now. It's, this is urgent. You want your deliverance now. And this is, this is true of, of all of us. I, I know even for, for myself, when, when I'm the most miserable, whatever the case may be, when I'm the most miserable, I just want it to stop now by any means necessary. And incidentally, I found that that in those moments is when Satan does his best work on me. When I want something to stop right now, by any means necessary, that is Satan's cue to put a temptation right in front of me. Just for your own reflection too, watch out for those moments. We also tend to focus on the bad guys we can see instead of our true enemies. That's what happened here. They were focusing on the Roman Empire. This evil force that was doing evil things for evil ends and oppressing them and just giving them the worst time. And they were barely able to feed their families. And all they could see was them, those evil Romans. When our true enemies are sin, the devil, and our own flesh, our own weakness. Those are our enemies. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. This was, uh, part of this was our last memory verse. It says, put on the full armor of God, or the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Those are our enemies. Our world fights over things like money, land, honor, and glory. The world fights over things like that. Rome certainly did. A lot of their conquests for, were for the glory of the empire. And yet Jesus came to teach us and to show us that the real battle is over hearts and minds. That's where the real battle is. It's not over land, it's not over money, it's not over power, it's not over honor, it's about hearts and minds. Who occupies your mind? What goals occupy your mind? What is your heart after in life? That is where the real battle is. Jesus came to save us from sin and the tyranny of the devil. It's much easier to point to Rome as the devil and the tax collectors as the sinners. That's easy. And it's in us to do that sort of thing. It's easier to say Democrats are the devil or Republicans are the devil than the ideas that drive them. It's much easier to see murderers and adulterers as sinners than myself as a sinner. There's a lot of sinners out there. It's easy to see them. It's a lot harder to see a sinner right here. That's hard. But that's what Jesus calls us to do. I am a sinner who needs forgiveness and salvation. And you are too. Let's look at the screen. And let's uh, respond to this together. What does the sixth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one means by ourselves we are too weak to hold our own even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong 
with the strength of your Holy Spirit so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. This is something that stays in my head a lot. Our sworn enemies are the devil and the world and our own flesh. Those are our enemies. Rome acted in in evil ways, but the same root of sin is in everybody. It's easy to look at Rome and think of how awful they were and see all the terrible things that they do, but it's a lot harder to see sin right here. And I think we do that too, or at least I know I do. It's easy to see the sin all out there. Lots of sin that gets reported on the news and you can think, oh, how terrible these people are and how awful they are, what sinners they are. And I don't really consider that there's a sinner right here. And that was why Jesus went after the Pharisees so much. The Pharisees thought they were good people. They did all the right things. They gave a tenth of everything they had. They fasted twice every week. They thought they were doing all the right things. They were good people. It's the other people who are bad. And Jesus came to, went after them the most. No. Look at your hearts. You look good on the outside, but what's on the inside? That's what's important. Who cares what you look like on the outside? It's what's on the inside that counts. And he went after them the most. Sin is in everyone, including us. And the king of the Jews came to conquer sin, not Rome. To their disappointment, and maybe sometimes to ours too. Jesus came not to defeat our earthly enemies, but to defeat the real enemies. Sin, the devil, and our own flesh. That's who Jesus came to defeat. They wanted a conqueror of the enemy that they could see, not the enemy within. And I would argue that our propensity is the same. We have that same tendency. Whenever we would choose to sin, to try to overthrow sin, we are asking for Barabbas. If you are ever fixated on a sin and you decide to sin in order to stop that sin, you are asking for Barabbas. Whenever we see evil in others, but we don't see evil in ourselves, we're asking for Barabbas. Whenever we say we want our justice now on our terms in the face of this, that, or another evil, we're asking for Barabbas. And I know I'm guilty of doing that. Jesus came to bring a kingdom that is beyond what we can imagine. And he came to talk about that. And that's why he healed. He healed people to say, this is what this kingdom is going to look like. He shared truth. This is what this kingdom is about. This is the kingdom I want you to follow. Who cares if Rome is ruling right now? Big deal. There's a kingdom that's coming that's eternal. And that's the one you want to invest in. Look at that kingdom. Look at me. I'm the king of that kingdom. Follow me into this kingdom. Bad stuff's going on right now. Yes, for sure. But this is what's important. Let's go there. Believing in Jesus means we are citizens of a borderless kingdom with unseen rewards and justice that comes later. And this is hard for us to accept as human beings in the here and now. But this is what Jesus was about. This is the kingdom that he came to inaugurate and to bring. This is folly to the human mind. This is ridiculous stuff in our own sinful nature. But if you were being saved, this is everything that we are hoping for and everything that is worth living for and dying for is what Jesus promised is to come. A glorious kingdom that will never end, where there is perfect justice and no more sin. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, it's 
It's difficult to focus on a kingdom that's coming when the kingdoms of this world are, are so in our face all the time and weigh us down a lot. Uh, Lord, we, we are easily discouraged by what we see going on around us. And we easily see the devil win and sin win. Lord, help us to keep our eyes set on what is to come of the borderless kingdom with rewards that are unseen but also unimaginable and justice that is perfect but that we just have to wait for. We pray all things in and only in the name of Jesus. Amen.